Cass, uh, she lives, as I said, in uh, in Jara country with uh, her partner and three gorgeous sons in a small intentional community. Uh, she also coordinates the Man Alexander Shire My Home Network, which is a collaboration of community and government organizations. Uh, lived experience of homelessness and or housing crisis and a community uh, and community members with uh, quite diverse uh, range of expertise. I think there's about uh, she says uh, 230 people on their database. Uh, she's passionate about social and environmental justice. She loves uh, loves playing guitar. She says badly. Uh, she loves to sing too, hiking and having a good malt whiskey with friends. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, we want to structure this that um, uh, we'll have uh, maybe 20 or, or 25 minutes of uh, uh, chat with, with Kaz where I'll, I'll be asking questions to her. I've been very lucky that um, I've been able to, to be at, at Kaz's place and uh, just pick her brain on all these uh, issues that we're starting to discuss here in East Gippsland. Um, and then after that, we'll have uh, a few more minutes for anybody in the in the audience to also ask questions to Cass. Um, but first, thank you very much, Cass, for um, for uh, agreeing to to be here. And oh, uh, thank you, thank you, Isaac. And I just want to thank everyone present and um, acknowledge your intentions, your commitment, your passion to do something about your local housing crisis. It's amazing. Well done. Thanks, guys. So maybe first, um, uh, tell us how how did the My Home Network uh, came about? Yeah, um, I'll try and be really brief here. I was I was doing another project around. It was really around um how to retain women who are experiencing systemic disadvantage in wage work, and it was really meant to be a review of the trainings they'd been offered. But what I found when I interviewed these women was that affordable housing was a major barrier to them. Um, maintaining a sense of place, like, you know, staying in one place and then therefore being able to uh, be recruited in wage work and be retained in that. So I basically asked the organization that employed me if we could sort of rescope the project and, in, and sort of interrogate the affordable housing matter a bit more. And and they agreed to that. And then we I did a bit of background research locally and then decided, well, we thought it'd be good to do a forum bringing various stakeholders together and community members and lived experience of homelessness together to start having a, a more collaborative conversation, recognizing the collective expertise in the room like yourselves and, and seeing where to go to from here. And from that first forum, the My Home Network kind of evolved. And and what uh, sort of organizations or expertise um, got involved and are part of the My Home Network yeah. today? Um, so we have uh, the community house. Uh, we have uh, our prime our health service, our um, community health service. We have uh, Naldron Education Aboriginal Corporation. Um, we have uh, Mount Alexander Shire disability sort of accommodation respite group we have our local disability advocacy group we have the salvation army we have st vincent's de paul we have haven home safe they're our regional housing provider um we also have our local sustainability group they bring a bit of that sort of energy efficiency climate change adaptation lens to the work um and who else oh the castlemaine institute they're a bit of a kind of local think tank um, yep. Yeah. And our local council doesn't sort of sit formally in the network, but we've sort of evolved a, a quite a close working relationship with them as well. I think that's everybody from the top of my head. That's, um, yeah, that's pretty impressive. There's a lot of, uh, a wide range of, uh, of groups in, in, in the, my home network and how do you, um, how do you formally organize yourselves and how do you get everybody to, kind of uh, um, have a say and, and, and start working on, on those <laughs> different priorities? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we have a steering committee. So they're more in charge of governance and the strategic direction and accountability. Um, so those organizations that I just spoke to you about, all of them sit on the steering committee along with community members. And we have uh, one person with lived experience of 
being unhoused or homeless sitting on the steering committee too. So, so we have that sort of um, different representation across the steering committee. Then we have a series of working groups that sit under the steering committee that are sort of responsible for particular focused action. Um, so that's, yeah, and they generally, um, they sort of, I suppose, report back to the steering committee. Yeah. So it's the Tiny Homes and Wheels Working Group, the Vacant Dwellings Working Group, an Advocacy Working Group, a Home Share Working Group. Um, there's another one, let me think. Oh, and the Tenants Rights Working Group. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so for, for a group like ourselves or, you know, group of people mm -hmm. that uh, we just, this is like the second time that we get together. Um, and I guess coming from, you know, I think that more generally we think, oh, we go to events and um, uh, we get a presentation and we get told what somebody else is going to do. Um, whereas I think that here, I think what we're trying to do is like, all right, how do we organize ourselves to actually do it? Um, yep. Which is what the My Home Network does. Uh, how? What do you think is... Um, one of the things that are important for people to know in terms of mm. um, uh, of, of, of becoming part of an advocacy group? Um, that's a good question. And I suppose, um, you know, in a sense, I feel that the answer I give is more, you know, it was referencing our community and the expertise and the capacity in our network so i'm sorry i don't know your community so well but what we started off doing was we realized um we didn't actually have a lot of local local data um which sort of was surprising so what i did was i did a bit of a housing profile so you know data around how many rough sleepers do we have how many people in housing crisis um what's the rental affordability um, and so it was to, and but also other data that helped shape a kind of broader picture, because it's not just about housing, it's about, we also got data around the, the factors or the disadvantage that compounds housing crisis. So we looked at family violence or elders, disability, and, you know, those other kind of the social determinants of health. So we sort of came up with a bit of a housing profile, which, to be honest, um, you know, looking at the percentage of Indigenous people in our population, those sort of demographics. And I think that helped us understand, you know, some of the significant, um, you know, the significant crisis we were in, as well as, right, OK, um, you know, we've got a larger percentage of elders in our community, a larger percentage of people who identify with a physical intellectual disability, and they are needing housing. They're, you know, they certainly are predisposed to homelessness. So that kind of helped us inform what our local housing needs were and, and housing dynamics. Like our rental affordability is pretty, pretty low. You know, it's down amongst 12 percent. So we thought, right, there's a lot of tenants in stress here. So it helped us sort of inform like where where are the areas that really need addressed and can we do something around that? It also helped politicians love a data profile. They love that stuff. So we went to our federal and state MPs with a, a one pager and said, this is our profile. This is what we want to do because, you know, informed by this data. We also got narrative from lived experience of homelessness and other, other community members. And we said, right, this is what we want to do. What can you do to help us? Mm. And uh, so this did did this come uh, uh, before the the working groups were established, or that kind of went alongside? Yeah, with the working alongside. Group? So yeah, sorry, I've probably been a bit short short there. So the first forum we had sort of three working groups coming out of that, according to what we thought were the the needs at that beginning. So there was a sort of data narrative one, then there was advocacy. And then there was around communications. So, and then slowly what then emerged from that was we realized we also, um, from the information we had, we realized that actually, um, you know, we saw that we've got a huge number of vacant dwellings in our shire as well. As we started to get the data, we thought, oh, um, and then there was a sort of tiny homes and wheels. So we then developed other working groups that came out of the information and our, as our knowledge built. And we sort of wanted to try and have some short wins. So you inspire and you feel a sense of agency, but also recognizing the parallel long-term advocacy for systemic change. So, so we then developed working groups on tiny homes and wheels, vacant dwellings, 
and the advocacy working groups sort of got a bit stronger. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where it went to. Yeah. And the home share working group, sorry, yes, as well. <laughs> yeah, let's let's delve a little bit into uh, some of those working groups and and the the achievements that uh, you've had in in those years. Um, let's talk about tiny houses first because mm -hmm. um, I think that you know you got some great outcomes in uh, in Man Alexander. Tell me about um, how did that campaign evolve and uh, and what did you achieve? Um. So uh, before, well, we'd, we'd had a bit of advocacy um, really targeting local council because it's a local law. And before our advocacy, our local law, um, you could have a tiny homes and wheels on land with a permanent dwelling for six weeks. And if, if you could demonstrate you would be unhoused um, once that six weeks was over, you, you, could, you could sometimes get a permit for up to six months, but generally people, it was six weeks. So what we did was we, we started sort of advocating closely with council, organizing, we had meetings with council officers, so planners, local law officers, and management and development services. I mean, our aim was to basically argue that it should be for an indefinite period, not six weeks. You know, six weeks doesn't do anything. And for a lot of people in our community, a tiny homes and wheels arguably is the only long term, secure, affordable housing option they have, whether it's an, an older woman, an elder, some young people or a family. Um, you know, that was so we had sort of data and evidence around that that need. Um, so we had conversations, independent conversations with council officers around we wanted it to be in an indefinite period um, with on-site waste management and with the ability to have like a, a, a financial transactional arrangement, not Airbnb, but for example, for our local housing team to be able to put tiny homes and wheels on somebody's land for crisis or transition housing. So that was a kind of advocacy pitch. So we had meetings with council officers and then councillors um, and then we had, we encouraged public consultations between council and the community. Um, and then basically it was a, a bit of a campaign and there was a record number of submissions. There was 1600 submissions to council on this. So, um, and 90, was it 96% or something were in favor of the council, sorry, council put up the proposed changes, which weren't everything we wanted. But their two proposed changes was they were getting rid of a permit process. There was an understanding that you still complied with the conditions of, of they were saying off-site waste management, which we didn't agree with, um, all weather, no commercial clause, so no financial transactional and no nuisance value, whatever you know nuisance you define. And but but the good thing was they went for the indefinite period. So you can now stay in your tiny homes and wheels in someone's land with a permanent dwelling for as long as you want. And as that's long now, as you comply with conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's now uh, in in the in the local law. In the local law, yeah, yeah. So that came about last June or July, yeah. So we're we're sort of hoping to maybe review that with council and see if we can push it a wee bit further. Mm. We'll see. And uh, this. Uh, to me, like this is like the first case in uh, council in Australia. Is that right? Yes, that's my under. Well, um, Yarra City have got a sort of similar, similar thing. Well, they got away with a, without a permit, but it's not quite indefinite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Um, no, that's great. That's such a such an amazing outcome, and and I guess it comes at the back of like a, a previous campaign on on trying to legalized tiny houses uh in man alexander and then you kind of this is kind of the the second attempt that second there's a really attempt, yeah. a really great podcast it's called candy tiny house uh, yeah Shannon, it's great. i think i've shared on the email but uh it, it explains all the the story of that that advocacy and um um yeah I'll, I'll share it again after after this meeting but um uh yeah let's let's talk about um some of those other working groups and um and maybe the um, uh the 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 house sharing model or the the Hansa Hansa model tell, yeah, tell us about share. this yeah so home share what we what we did was we initially when we had a tenants rights working group um 
we were looking at like what kind of things could we do in a local community and um we knew that for example in our community 33 percent of our households are single person and two percent of our housing stock is one bedroom so there was a lot of single people living in three four bedroom houses and we have a significant percentage of older people living alone so we thought there's probably a bit of we did a feasibility study to see who would be interested in the Home Share programme, which is an internationally renowned programme matching people who wish to remain living independently in their home. Either usually it's an elder or somebody who identifies with a disability, but are at risk of premature institutionalisation because they can't look after themselves. So the Home Share programme matches them with somebody who can come and live with them and give them company and practical assistance for free boardings and lodgings. So we did a bit of a feasibility study. And um, we're pleasantly surprised with the results. So both potentially people who would be wanting to live, continue to live in their homes, but also people interested in being what we call home seekers. And about 85% of people who did the survey were both interested in, you know, looking, exploring this project more. So we felt, right, you know, the community is supporting this. So we um, then we started looking for funding to try and get a home share coordinator. But we joined Hansa, which is the Home Share Australia New Zealand Alliance, and they're a phenomenal resource. They're a phenomenal resource. So I was sort of um, in communities of practice with them and learning a lot. We're the first rural regional model in Australia. Um, the New Zealand government are funding, federal government are funding five pilot trials in home share New Zealand rural regional models. But anyway, to cut a long story short, after... It was really hard getting funding because, as you probably know, organisations want to fund bricks and mortar. They want to see stuff on the ground. And I was requesting funding for a process, you know, for EFT to coordinate this programme. So eventually, after a couple of years of trying to get funding, it was through a local philanthropist that we got the funding, which was great. And have you have you got any um, any data on, on, on the service and how many people... So has it has it matched yeah so there was um we've got a phenomenal coordinator and so the first gosh first six eight months it was really around setting up uh governance and operational sort of structures and there's there's a lot of paper well it's good paperwork but there's as you can imagine quite a bit of paperwork in terms of the matching so there's various interview assessments you know you you talk to family um, it's a very considered process. So there's a couple of matches we've made, which is fantastic. So we're there's a kind of probation period of three months. So we're just waiting for three months and then we'll have a bit of a, hopefully a media explosion around how they're going. But things seem to be going really well at the moment. Um, but I think, I think for our rural regional model, you know, comparing it to other metro models that and people I've spoken to, I think for us, for our community, it's not just about the matches, it's about building the capacity of the community as a whole to support this. So it's not just putting two people together, it's actually getting the community to support that match in a broader sense and build community as as a whole, if you get what I mean. That's what we're feeling that's what about. And that's what will enable the community to understand the housing crisis in a broader way and support all the different community-led initiatives we're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's a that's a good segue um, to um, the next sort of topic I wanna I wanna discuss with you, which is the um, relationship with council, but also specifically uh, the appointment of a uh, housing uh, broker. Solution. Yeah, is, housing is solutions right? broker. Yeah, that, that was also something that. Um, my home network was involved with is that right uh we well, probably i think i th i don't know if we were directly involved with we were having conversations with council around we were wanting to develop a 10-year strategy and we we're sort of talking to council about their role in that and then um they had i'm trying to remember this clearly but i think then they realized what what they kept saying to us, we don't have EFT in our council. We don't have a dedicated housing solutions officer. And I think at one point we just said, well, why don't you go to the state government and ask for funding for a housing solutions broker? And even if you do it as a cluster of small regional councils. So I suppose we, we kind of gave them the idea. Um, 
but with without really knowing if that was possible or not. And um, I mean, to their credit, they then went to the state government and I think they rescoped a project they were going to get funding for anyway, but it was more bricks and mortar on the ground. And they rescoped that and used the funding for EFT for a housing solutions broker. So that was for a year. And then to their credit, they repeated the, they they took out of their council budget. They funded her position for another year and now she's permanent. Right. And tell us, tell us what's, what are some of those um, outcomes or achievements since that um, uh, office has been in council? So um, Claire's primary, sorry, her name is Claire. Her primary role is to optimize um, sort of social housing coming out of the big housing build. That was her earlier role. I hope she doesn't mind me talking on her behalf. I'll only say what I'm really, really confident about. <laughs> um, but she, so she's um, she's worked really hard and now council have basically committed to sort of two areas of land. They call it air rights because it's it's sort of um, they, where they can put social housing, but it's above a car park, a council owned car park and above another building. So they've they've committed to two areas of land for potentially forty two social housing if they get funding for it. They've also committed to um, two areas of land in Malden and Newstead. I can't remember the size of them, but you know I think they're standard blocks of land for social housing if Wintringham Housing, who are a sort of regional housing provider, can get funding. Um, and and most recently, they have developed the concept of a charitable housing trust and have just approved the legal deed that's the sort of start of the governance of such a housing trust. So we're sort of supporting them in that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so in terms of um, building those relationships with uh, with the local council, and yeah. uh, I heard you saying uh, another time that you tried to get uh, in meetings about housing, also uh, staff from council that are from different departments, not necessarily yes. just the planning department, but also yep. welfare or you know all all the across across the board. So they're kind of part of those those conversations. Uh, yep. So maybe tell me uh, how how you build uh, those relationships with uh, with council. Do you have to be really really annoying and uh, writing to them or calling them every day or um or, or you do that uh, with patience and over time yeah look i suppose i don't know what your council's like i mean our council you know they have i think they've really demonstrated incredible leadership they are a council um and they they you know they're based on a regulatory framework i think you know i I don't think you can underestimate relationships and building relationships and sometimes that takes time but i think especially well, this is my limited experience working with our local council. I think those building relationships. Um, look, what what I kind of used as a bit of a tool was I mapped all the different council strategies. So the council plan, the well-being strategy, housing plan, disability action plan. I sort of looked at all those strategies and then we, we developed a 10-year strategy and, and demonstrated how what we were doing aligned with all those strategies and plans. So really sort of started to broaden the conversation around housing more out to demonstrate to them that actually everything you do is linking to housing in a sense. So that sort of gave me a bit more leverage to have a broader conversation within council, not just with the housing officer. So, you know, with climate change officer, with planners, with inclusion and diversity officers, you know, have a broader conversation, but I think relationships is key. And, um, you know, just being really strategic in who you're linking with and, and those relationships. And I suppose maybe just CC everyone in your emails. So they're all always <laughs> some of the conversations you're having. Um, I don't know what, what capacity your council's got, but um, we do have a community engagement officer. And I think I've got a pretty good relationship with her and our and our comms person. Really, comms person's good. He, you know, they, they get it. Yeah, so I think... Um, just having those conversations and demonstrating to them the, the benefit that this will have for them as council in their role if they come on board. And you've touched on the 10-year strategy that My Home Network has developed. Mm -hmm. uh, 
what what was the what was the purpose of developing that strategy and how 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 are you tracking how is it how is it helping you um well it was interesting we started i don't know if you remember there was a few years ago the state government requested submissions to the development of their 10 year strategy um so we set up a 10 year strategy working group and we started working on that and there was a bit of a template you know that you answered the questions and and we were filling this in and then we got to a point where we all thought geez this is why don't we just develop our own 10 year strategy with what we've put in here and then we submitted it to government and then they never really released their 10 year strategy they they got to a launching point and then it never happened suddenly it was cancelled and we didn't hear anything more and then we thought well we felt we had quite a lot of good information you know we had our data profile we had narrative we'd started work we had a lot of good regional and specialist expertise and we thought right let's let's develop our own 10 year strategy and that'll help us with some short, medium term and long term outcomes. And it'll give us a framework for being accountable because we really wanted to put some targets in there. So yeah, that's kind of basically where it came from. Yeah. Uh, I'm just like, still like, a, <laughs> it's quite amazing that you've done all, all that in uh, what is it like four years since uh, my home network was created. Well, well, it's the community. Uh, yeah, yeah, the network and community. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, how how do you how do you get um what does it take to to do all those things in uh in such a short time frame? I think. Oh gosh, I don't know. I mean, I suppose you know, there's a tremendous amount of collective expertise, as there will be in your community. You know, and I think it's tapping into that, um, connecting people, collaborating breaking down those silos um, somehow. And sometimes I feel this is problematic for me. I'm not saying for others, but the, the sense of agency that people feel they are, they are, they're, they're doing something that has outcomes, how you do that. Um, but, um, and I suppose it's, you know, sometimes it's been really timely. Um, and sometimes things like, like our advocacy, we were advocating to the state government. And sometimes I'm one of these people, I get terribly frustrated with bureaucracy. Um, and we were advocating to the state government around a secondary dwelling, streamlining the planning permit process and a vacant property tax. And we were getting nothing back. We weren't getting any meetings apart from with our own MP. And then suddenly there was a housing statement saying, right, secondary dwellings, the planning, you know, the planning process is streamlined. And last October, the state government said, right, we're expanding the vacant property tax. So sometimes you just get these wins that, um, and I'm not saying we were primarily responsible, but, you know, that gives you such a lift. You keep going. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Sometimes you don't know where it comes from, but look, it's the outcome that you you were after. Um, yeah. I've got one more question and then we'll open to everybody else to ask uh, more questions if they have any. Uh, but and I guess you've you've said a few give us a few recommendations on your last uh your last question but uh, your last answer but um what what would be your advice for um for us uh you know uh, a group that kind of it's starting to have conversations now and we're trying to to get organized to get some uh outcomes in the in the housing space what would be what would be like your um uh, your your top advice oh gosh um <laughs> Look, it was interesting. We've begun to reflect on the work of the My Home Network and what are the, like a bit of a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses. And it's interesting um, listening to some people. They really think having a paid coordinator does help. Like I think there's great strengths in, in a bunch of volunteers doing stuff because it's very organic and it's authentic. And But they, did, they are arguing that, you know, having a paid volunteer just gives it a bit of stability and um, and we're auspiced by our local primary health, which I think gives us a bit of legitimacy. You know, there's a real, I feel sometimes there's that tension between being a bunch, uh, a network that could be really quite radical, but because we're auspiced by a primary health, it sort of toes the line a little bit more, which I think is a good thing in a way. It's, it's a... Yeah, it's a there's complexity there. So I think if you can get, I don't know if there's a possibility of either somebody say in your community health organization or somebody who could uh have a point two during the week to coordinate a network or or if you look for funding for it. Um 
but certainly I think that's helped us, you know, just with the vagaries of volunteerism. And especially I think in something like housing where it is complex and you need, I feel you need to have that diversity of people in the room. And that's, that takes a bit of effort to keep everyone in the room talking to each other when everyone's flat out, but, you know, in all sectors, but especially in the housing sector, it's so, it's so overwhelmed how you keep people talking. Yeah. Um, and trust, you know, you know, your community, you know what the dynamics are and the needs are, um, be informed. Um, yeah. And, and it's also, I suppose that go at the speed of trust, I feel as well, building on that trust. Mm. Thanks so much, Cass. That's a uh, absolute pleasure to, to talk to you again. Oh, no, um, likewise. We'll, um, open now to any further questions. If anybody's got questions for Cass. Hello, Kaz. My name's Chris. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. So can you hear me okay? Is that working? Yeah, I can. No worries. Okay. My question's about... I'm all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. My question's about the home share. How do you match people where the elder or the disabled person is protected in from elder abuse from the person that's actually going to be sharing the space. Uh, that's how did you come yeah. to a way for them to live together and know that that person's going to be protected? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so our, our home share coordinator, um, because it's auspiced by Delkaya Health, there's a whole heap of, um, I suppose, guidelines and policies and procedures within the primary health that's relevant to this sort of matching. So um, so Di would be able, our home share coordinator would be able to answer these questions a lot better than I am, but there's a whole heap of, when, when they do an assessment, there then is in the contract, there's a whole heap of other um, documentation that sits under that, that has all these assurances and protections around um, the safety of both the home seeker and the home provider. And often um, we'd really encourage in the interviews, like an elder, that family members are part of the interview. Um, and, and say, for example, if it's an elder, agencies that are already involved in looking after that person, they're included in the interview. Um, and, and same with the home seeker. Yeah. I don't know if that answers it well, but... I'm happy to, um, you know, die. You could, we could actually organize a meeting if you want. Um, with Di, the home share coordinator, could maybe present to you as well. Um, because she's right across all of this. So obviously, in operationalizing all of this, so we could organize that too if there's if there's interest in a bit of a home share sharing as well. Has um. Uh, okay, uh, Kaz, um, if you had your. Hi, Grace. Hello. I thought it was you. If you had your if you, if you had your four years over again, is there anything you would do differently? Oh, that's a good question. Ah, that's a good question, Grace. Jeez. Um what would I do differently? Um well, that's probably a question for the whole network, I reckon. But I think that's partly why I want to reflect on what work we've done. And what could we have done differently? I sometimes feel we're a bit thinly spread. So sometimes I feel maybe if we've just, you know, I tend to, I think we tend to try and respond to everything because everything seems to be in such crisis. Um, maybe just really focusing on certain things um, sometimes. Um, that's not really, that's a good one. I should have thought about this more. Um I'm sure there's things we would have done differently or the network would think about doing differently. Um, hmm. That's a good one. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> uh, well, just to add to it, would you have set up the groups earlier? Would I have set up, sorry, the... the... The working groups that you have, would you have set them up earlier to get everyone working on them? Yeah. I think, Grace, um... Yeah, I th I think people, I feel the, the traction and the 
organic kind of evolution of these working groups happened as people felt better informed about uh, where where the traction was going to be or where the opportunities were. So the, the Tiny Homes and Wheels Law, you know, we kind of, that was just right at the beginning of the My Home Network. Really, we just started. And, and that was a disappointment in that first decision by council. And then it's sort of, I suppose, the interest in Tiny Homes and Wheels sort of dropped because we thought, well, they're not going to review the local law again. But then it picked up again as the need for Tiny Homes and Wheels kind of developed again because housing was just getting so unaffordable. Um, but, yeah, sometimes I think there is a real tension in, as I said, that sense of agency that people feel that you're really doing something. You're getting your hands dirty together and achieving something. And maybe maybe those, you're right, maybe those working groups that were really about action, maybe they could have started earlier. Um, the Vacant Dwellings Working Group, it's a sort of slow burn, but but sometimes when we get a vacant vacant dwelling released, there's a real that's a that's a home for somebody. You know, that's either and especially when we get them released as transition housing, you know, the housing team love that. Um, you know, and there's a thousand, I don't know what it's like in East Gippsland. We've got a thousand vacant dwellings that are lying idle. It's just ridiculous. So um yeah. I think Grace, I, I sometimes get frustrated. I'd love to have more traction with landlords and real estates. That's a real, uh, that's a tricky one. We are building, what well, our residential tenancies commissioner thinks we're building significant relationships with our real estates. But I, between you, me and the gatepost, I still get a bit frustrated there. We've, we, we always invite the real estates to our forums and um, we have fairly regular meetings with the directors of the real estates to update them in the My Home Network and try and get them to engage a bit more. We we want to start a not-for-profit real estate, but um, none of the real estates are interested in that. <laughs> so we're looking to see if we can do it some some other way. Yeah. There is a not-for-profit real estate in Melbourne, but they don't want to do outreach as far as Castlemaine. So we're trying to think laterally around how we can do that. So if you've got any ideas... Yeah. Um, hey, Kaz. Uh, Hi, how are you doing? Thanks. Thanks for um, taking the time to do this. No, pleasure. Super interesting. Um, I, I'm wondering, like, how many how many people roughly do you think there are, like, in, in the home network working actively, like, spread yep. out into the working groups? And also, like, over the past four years that you've been operating, has there been, a, like, a big fluctuation in the people coming and going like more new people coming and helping and old people leaving or yeah yeah no that's a great question um i reckon across the working groups we've probably got about 50 people that are in the working groups um our database like i could you know i ask people do you want you know uh that, because not a lot of people have actually dropped off the database um and the website do get quite a lot of hits so um, but it is sometimes a concern of mine, as I said, like what, what do people feel is the sense of agency? But then I think people also feel, I mean, our communications is basically, it's like a monthly update, if you want, or a newsletter about all the action that's happened. Um, and then we have uh, different, normally we have at least two forums a year, like community forums where we're face-to-face -face explaining to the community and the network what, what we're doing. And then often there's other forums, targeted forums, like we did a tenants energy efficiency forum, collective housing forums. So there's different sort of public interfaces to demonstrate what we're doing. But I do sometimes wonder if there's a lot in the database that actually don't really know what's going on, but certainly it's grown. And, and we're constantly, we're still getting people wanting to subscribe through either the website or they hear about, um, you know, from our media releases and comms with, with general communications with the community, which has actually surprised me a bit, but yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> I've just got one in terms of, uh, yeah. How do you, communicate your communicate with um with people do you also have uh, social media accounts or it's just mainly the newsletter that you try and you try to avoid facebook 
yeah. Um, Delkaya Health does put stuff on their social media, but we don't like have a My Home Network Facebook page. So stuff is advertised like our our update will go on social media or any any forums or if there's something something pressing that we want to raise awareness about, it'll go out on social media. Um, we do kind of fairly regular main FM interviews as well, as well as media releases. Um, yeah, that's probably our comms, media releases, forums. Yeah, a bit of social media. I do, yeah, look, it's we constantly revisit this thing about maybe having more in social media. But actually what's happening now is um, members of the network will sometimes put stuff on Castlemania or other Facebook pages and just respond to it in their own way. It's a sort of self-organizing, self-limiting way of doing it. And I think that's not bad because then I don't have to monitor what's going on the Facebook page and responding to a bunch of nutbags, you know, um, bagging rough sleepers or something. So it's it's kind of good. People can just respond as they feel they need to. And they might make, they'll make me aware of the dialogue that's happening in the community. So I know maybe where the friction points are or what we need to address. But I think, I think that's, I feel that's not a bad way of dealing with it. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Um, hi, my name's Tom Crook. I'm the mayor of the Escape Land Shire. Thanks for your presentation. Really interesting hi. to hear what other councils are doing. I think it's fair to say there is an interest in this space in our in our council within the councillor group itself. Um, there's an acknowledgement of the challenges that our region and and more broadly face around around housing, but within our officer base, uh, there's in in my experience, there's been a bit of pushback in that they say, "Oh, look, housing's really a state responsibility." And while on the face of it, that that may be true in a legislative sense, we've learned today and from other other experiences, there are actually lots of things councils can do in this space mm. that that aren't uh, there's no that aren't don't cross over into that state jurisdiction. There, they sit fairly within councils' remit, if you like. Um, I'm interested to hear from you how you originally approached council, whether that was via councillors themselves or the staff and where you found that sort of sweet spot was. Um, if you could just talk a bit more about your work with council, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah. No, thanks, Tom. And good on you. Good on you attending today and being very present in your local conversation. Um, and look, our mayor, our council mayor, um, Matthew Driscoll, has been pivotal since the start. And he actually... Um, after conversations with him, he pushed that motion around reviewing the local, the tiny homes wheel local law. Um, and he and another councillor, Rosie Nair, have been really very significant in pushing certain housing outcomes within council, as you said, Tom, recognising actually what council can have a role in. Um, so to begin with, with our first My Home Network forum, I invited all the councillors, council officers, um, for our little, we had like a, then in these early days, a little, like a little working group that helped me uh, with the forum and, and potentially what could come out the forum. And there was the a community partnerships officer who was on that steering group and she was very passionate about housing. Um, so I suppose it's those, Tom, you'll know who in your council's really passionate and has influence, you know, those sort of combination and, um, I suppose having conversations with them, but she was quite, yeah, she was quite significant. And I I did get councillors in the room, but she was able to then internally liaise with some others and get them involved in the conversation. Um, and certainly I feel some of the councillors wanted, they really wanted to do something about it. But as you've said, they said their hands were tied a bit or they couldn't commit to things. Um, we did brief council, I think about two years ago, with the work of the My Home Network and what we really wanted to do and had some minimum and bigger asks of them. Um, and I think that was a good thing to do. So that was both council councillors and some council officers, well, the exec, really. Um, and while I think, to be honest, we were a wee bit disappointed, we didn't get an awful lot of traction, I think it actually raised awareness amongst the councillors again about the, you know, we were we shared data, we shared the work we were doing, and I think that helped them understand maybe where there could be traction. 
And it was later on in the game, that was when they came back with, look, we might review the the Tiny Homes and Wheels local law. And they were very, they've been very supportive of the home share concept, but said they couldn't support it in any way, apart from maybe communications. Um, and then, yes, I suppose that, but maybe, I don't know, uh, I'm not quite sure at a municipality association of Victoria level what conversations go on amongst councils. I, I believe, you know, housing is up there, but I'm not quite sure how much collaboration and sharing of information is happening there. But I imagine that would be a good space for um or just connect directly with um Matthew Driscoll and Darren Fuzzard, our CEO, who's been quite yeah, he's he's been very um significant, I think, in in, you know, committing uh Pretty, you know, investing quite significantly in our housing solutions broker, and they've committed five hundred thousand dollars to trying to set up the affordable housing trust. I don't know if that that kind of helps. It's a yeah, bit of a long story cut short, but yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that's that's great, Cass. Um, if no one else has any more questions, oh yeah, there's one back there. I mean, mine's, mine's sort of, can you hear me, Cass? Yes, I can. Yeah, mine's sort of more of a um, statement, I suppose, rather than a question. But there seems to be a huge gap between the haves and the have-nots. And, I mean, mm -hmm. not saying anything against local council, but it seems to be really weird what happens in this town. I mean, a couple of years ago, there was a block of land for sale, 11 acres on the highway. 360,000 seemed like a real bargain, you know, can be, can be subdivided subject to council approval. Then all of a sudden it's sold it, within two months, it's cut into 12 blocks at a collective price of $3 million. And I mean, can't anything be done like every time there's a housing development, why isn't 10% of those blocks given to the government as a tax and then those yeah. blocks given to poor people with an interest-free loan to build a house i mean just around the corner from where i live on cahoon road there's going to be 165 um block housing development there soon i mean why can't we push for any of that housing development to be given to poor people i mean there's just Rich people are getting richer and richer and poor people are stuck in generational poverty of renting all their lives and then their kids renting all their lives. You know, I've got four children myself and I worry that their rent's going to go so far through the roof, they'll have to move in with me. Yep. Yep. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, I don't know if Tom... Your council, your mayor wants to respond, or before I say I respond, or yeah, look, I, I can. I guess I don't. I don't have a lot to say other than the that quota idea is is not new. It's something that's been uh, floated within council. It's something that the developers themselves push back against really hard. Um, I'm personally completely in favour of it. If we can get the rest of the council in favour of it too, then it's something that in theory we could make happen. It's just a question of putting that collective pressure on the councillor group as a whole to get them to make that decision. So it is actually possible. It just hasn't happened yet because the councillor group haven't made it happen. Um, thank you. Um, and thanks for your comment and sharing that. Um, I agree. I've got three boys and one of them sort of couch surfing kind of renting in Melbourne. And he's got friends that are intense on top of cars. You know, it's just ridiculous what our young people are having to go through. And, you know, the, the fu you know, the future kind of vision, um, in our 10 year strategy, um, there is wording from council around, I, th I think they said explored or, uh, consider, an option of inclusionary zoning. So as you said, you know, that developers have to contribute um, 10, 20% of their development to social housing, affordable housing. Um, but that's, it's, the wording is explore or consider. And I'm not, yeah, I don't think an awful lot of 
conversations happen there, but um, I will check in with Claire. It's one thing I was meant to check in with her. Um, the other thing is, I suppose that's where council are coming with this concept of a charitable, uh, affordable housing trust, where, I mean, lots of people would argue it's not a cost of living crisis, a cost of land crisis that we're going through. And um, I'm, not, I'm not taking away from, you know, other costs that are escalating but um i think that's where i'm really glad we've got a charitable well hopefully charitable housing trust that may evolve because then that gives you that platform where the land is in trust so you're not paying for the cost of land you're paying to for the rental of the house or the the value of the house that only goes up with cpi so that that hopefully does provide a much more affordable option um, I don't know if you know of Carl Fitzgerald, you know, Grounded, the NGO that's around community land trust, but they did that great report on land banking by developers. And essentially that gave them leverage to advocate for that, not just vacant property tax, but land tax when it's not being utilised, it's just being held as a kind of unearned income. So I think there's, while I hope I hear your frustrations, I feel there are some concepts that, that we can push them along a bit more. Um, but certainly, you know, we we recognise the main drivers for the housing crisis are some of these um, financial and tax mechanisms that compound inequity and um, and need to be challenged and and advocated to, to challenge them, um, as well as the lack of investment, you know, decades of lack of investment in social housing. I don't know what it's like in East Gippsland, but we're, in our small shire, we're 600 social housing short, and that's having a huge impact on our, our tenants who 87 percent of them can't pay the rent um and also the mismatch in housing you know as i think i mentioned before we've got two percent single single bedroom units and again the, i believe this is a planning and a developers thing that developers don't necessarily want to build one bedroom units because the payback's not as much they've got to put in the same infrastructure as say a three four bedroom dwelling but the payback on a three four bedroom dwellings a lot more sorry i'm digressing a bit but i hope that you feel, yeah, there's some avenues for action there, hopefully. Yeah, thanks. Um, I've got another question. I'm wondering, like, um, whether the My Home Network is set up then as, like, a not-for-profit organization or what What kind of official registration you guys went about for that and how, um, how crucial that was, um, you know, how early on you formed that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we're a, we're a, we're a sort of network hospice by our primary health organization, which says DGR status. So they're incorporated. So we sort of sit under their governance structure, which is great, because it means yeah, you right. know, we didn't have to become incorporated ourselves. And um, so and also we um we sit in that governance structure and can tap into you know their comms, their admin, a whole heap of other other valuable resources yeah yep but good question yep hi kaz i'm jane greason i'm another councillor um hi jane I, I, I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit more information about the tiny homes on wheels and what negotiations you were successful with with your planning department in local government there and how many private home owners have you found who might be interested in having a tiny home on their property? Thank you. Um, so where where we um thanks Jane, where we're wanting to sort of review the tiny homes and wheels local law with council is around at the moment, um in the local law, uh waste so that's both um grey water black water, um has to be removed off site. And we're still advocating that that doesn't necessarily need to be the case, that there's on-site systems that are um, approved and can be used. So that's a conversation we're hoping to start again with. Um, it was actually not just planning, but in the environmental health inspector. So we're hoping to kind of respectfully review that, that position. Um, also, as I think I... I spoke before, we're hoping to review, I think they call it the commercial clause in the local law that can we have some exemptions to that? Like, for example, the housing team can 
who who quite often get an offer of either a free caravan or a subsidized caravan for people in crisis but don't have land to put it on so if we had an exemption in the local law where you're not allowed to pay rent the housing team could pay rent to somebody to put that caravan on land for somebody in crisis and the caravans work apparently work quite well for our young men that are homeless um and then in terms of because the council changed it so that you don't have to get a permit they can't really monitor how many people like the the full impact in a quantitative way of the changes in local law but we feel anecdotally our network has either supported people with information or helping matches um roughly about 20 20 people but there's probably more than that that have happened in a sort of self-organizing way um yeah and some people do it's like a handshake and others wish a more legally binding agreement that protects both parties so we've been trying to help people in terms of not that we're lawyers and can draft up a contract but just help them with what they should consider in some of the terms and conditions if that makes sense yeah that's great guys i think and that brings us almost to the hour so um, <laughs> i think I'll, I'll be talking the, another hour <laughs> with you. but uh, i think uh we we have a lot to chat as well amongst ourselves but um yeah i think thank you very much for for oh, giving no, us your, you. your time and uh i'm sure that uh, uh we'll have more chances or maybe i'll i'll have more more questions for you in the <laughs> future and um i think that my home network is really an inspiration for um what i'm hoping we can achieve in uh in east gippsland um oh, but yeah. yeah i think until next time thank you thank you very much no thank you no thank you and i think look good on you all it's fantastic to see what you're doing and there's other networks like there's other shires that are interested in setting up housing networks too and i think um probably one thing maybe i haven't been clear about this but i feel as a network you know the housing thing it's got to be about social equity as well and that's a long-term journey but if we don't start off well I feel with the network you know all those actions as Grace said you know the sort of action but if we don't start off kind of with integrity around this this is about social equity so you know those groups and organizations that are on our steering committee are crucial to bring that lens and how we do this um then we're not we're not going to provide everyone with safe, affordable, secure, appropriate housing. You know, it's as your friend here said, it's going to be more of the have and the have nots. And we've got to stop that. So, yeah. Right. And I know you know that. <laughs> Just... right. But so thank much, you so guys. much. Thank, thank you. you. Maybe sometime we can get together. Yeah, that's it. My home network and what what are you calling yourselves? If you you probably uh, haven't got I a name yet. I don't even know we have a name yet. But <laughs> <laughs> it's Gippsland Housing Affordability Conversation so far. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? E G well, <laughs> Ega Ega. <laughs> no, please, no more acronyms. Um, <laughs> we'll bring you. We'll bring you over when the weather's nicer. Yeah. Yeah. We'll oh that. yes. Oh no! Look, I don't <laughs> mind the rain. It's the clothes you wear. There's no such thing as bad weather. <laughs> yeah. Sounds Excellent. Good. Thanks so much. All everyone. the best, guys. Yeah. All yeah. Take best. care. Eh? Thanks.